Thanks for joining the latest Hedera virtual meetup. I'm Cooper, the developer evangelist at Hedera, who you probably know from our past videos or our YouTube tutorial series. Uh, but today I'm very excited to be joined by the Public Pest Network, one of my favorite projects building on Hedera, who actually came to us from the M Major League Hacking's Hack the Chain event. They also took second place overall in the Hedera 20 virtual hackathon. Um, so we're going to hang out just a few minutes while people join the YouTube chat and can, you know, welcome each other in the, in the YouTube uh, before we dive into a presentation where they're talking about the cool problems that they're solving around tracking bugs with the Hedera consensus service uh, and also give us a pretty cool live demo, uh, assuming that that all works out as uh, live demos are always the most fun. Um, but for anyone who has questions for me, the Hedera team, or the lovely members of the Public Pest Network that we have here, uh, please ask us questions throughout the stream. We'll answer some of them as we go. We'll answer the rest of them at the end of the, the live stream. Uh, so thanks everyone. Katie, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for asking and thanks for having us. I'm super excited for this. We are thrilled to have you. Like I said, one of my favorite projects building on Hedera. And I love this kind of like bug background you got going on. Like, can you tell us like before we get started, what's the origin of the, uh, is that a beetle on your wall? Oh yeah, that is a beetle. And I also have a pupa here. And then I have another, like I have a bunch more paintings. I paint bugs in my free time. So yeah, I've always loved bugs. <laughs> That's really great. It seems like you're going down the right uh, profession here. Uh, Jacob, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about yourself, Coop? I'm great. I see you don't have the bug artistic skills that Katie has, but you got uh, like this nice kitchen setup going on. Uh, yes. Yeah, sadly, I don't. I don't have the artistic skills that uh, Katie has, but I mean, we've got some. We've got some good antiques that I've picked up at a Goodwill every now and then. <laughs> It's okay, we're programmers. I don't think people are judging <laughs> us based off our paintings. Uh, Lily, how are you today? Hey, Cooper, I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. We are very thrilled to have you. And last but certainly not least, Brian, how are you? I like the beard that you're rocking. Thank you, I'm doing pretty well. A little bit nervous. I wasn't expecting to be judged on my wall decor, but oh no i just love <laughs> to find things to put people on the spot there uh don't worry we can circle back to your wall decor uh if, if you'd like <laughs> okay i'm good thank you though okay well this is great it seems like we're getting a good kind of solid group of people in the youtube chat thank you everyone for joining uh like i said at the beginning i'm cooper at hedera hashgraph uh, one of our developer evangelists and today we're joined by the public pest network uh Brian or Katie, would you like to kick us off with your presentation tonight? I can see your screen, by the way. Okay, perfect. It looks like Brian is going to be sharing his screen. I will, I'll just give him a second. No problems. And like I said, Please throw your questions in the YouTube chat. We'll try to answer some of them as we go and save some time for, for Q&A at the end. OK, so we are the Public Pest Network. And to start off, um, I think we're all going to introduce ourselves. So first, my name is Katie. I am an entomologist at the University of Kentucky. I'm getting my master's. And I still have about a year left in the program. And I do research on reducing toxic pesticide use and improving the sustainability of pest control. Hey everybody, I'm Jacob. I'm a computer science major at Xavier University and I did most of the uh, front end and uh, user experience work on our on the project so far. Hi, I'm Lily Sutton. I'm getting my bachelor's degree in computer science at the University of Kentucky and I worked on the back end and setting up the database. Hi there, uh, my name is Brian Rasick. I'm a software engineer at a seafood sustainability company by day. Um, I work a lot with IoT and data science stuff, um, but uh, for this project, I did everything else that Lillian Jacob didn't do. Well, that's great. Thanks everyone for joining the, the live stream. I'm curious how you all, all met. 
Okay. Before, so, we, yeah, I, before diving into the Prezzo, can we get a little context on, because I see he goes to Xavier, yeah. you know. I'm from Louisville originally, but I moved to Lexington about a year ago to start my master's program. And then that's when I just kind of ran into Brian. Um, and then he was already friends with Jacob and Lily. So then we all just kind of became friends. That's great. I yeah, love, I love the origin story. I think we specifically actually, uh, th this was originally for another hackathon as, as mentioned in MLH one. Um, and we, uh, Jacob, Lily and I are all been pretty close friends. And we had a, we had an idea. We were looking for an idea about uh, how to do that. Uh, Emily hackathon was specifically about blockchain. Um, and so we had made fun of Katie who had been on our couch pretty often doing some of these bug cards, which we'll get into later, uh, which is the most uh, uh, it takes forever and she has these little bugs and sometimes she's a little magnifying glass and she has to go tally all the bugs and then she's put on an excel sheet we'd always made fun of her and been like hey we're i mean this is the this is the most archaic way of doing this project i've ever seen we, we got to make you you're sitting in a room full of in like a house full of computer scientists we're gonna we're gonna make you a better solution and then it ended up that our idea for katie and then the it happened with the mlh hackathon it ended up being something that actually did end up working a little better than we thought so it's it's very exciting <laughs> I love it. Two hackathons and a lot of prizes later. Um, very excited to learn more about what you guys are doing. Yeah, so first I can start off talking about kind of what I do, if that works. Yeah, so um, I work with professors and extension personnel from around Kentucky. Extension agents are people who work with the government and the public, and they try to solve pest problems or agricultural problems, whatever's happening. And they're in each county in Kentucky. So usually you will have about 120 because there's 120 counties in Kentucky. Um, mainly what I do is I set sticky traps in high tunnels and high tunnels are like greenhouses, except the sides open up and the front and back open up too. So it's kind of like an open space with the greenhouse. You still have the greenhouse like top in sides. Um, I set these traps every week or sometimes bi-weekly and then I go and collect them. Sometimes they'll be mailed to me and then I look at those under a microscope and I tally up the amount of pests on those cards. It's really tedious like Brian was saying. <laughs> the way that I do it now is by you know pen and paper tallying like oh there's 100 thrips or whatever, um, and that's a thrips on the screen. They're microscopic, so I use my scope and go through every each and every card circling with my ultra fine point Sharpie. <laughs> and then after that, to actually publish the data, it's not really published, it's just I take my notes and I record it onto an Excel spreadsheet, and then this is what you end up with. Um, it's just dates and then numbers and yeah, that's pretty much it. This is actually real data that you're looking at right now. This is from Taylor County, one of the tunnels that I work with. It is from an Amish grower. So sadly he won't be seeing this tonight, but that's, that's fine. <laughs> so I heard the Amish the, are very into their cryptocurrencies and blockchains. Wait, say it again. Uh, I heard the Amish are surprisingly into crypto and blockchains. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You never know. Um, so I'm working in these four counties right now. Fayette is in Lexington, and then the rest of these counties are south, east, and central Kentucky. Um, when I get these just piles of data, I use them to make personalized pest solutions for each farm. And just real quick, I'm gonna talk about some language that we'll be using in this presentation. When we talk about data reviewers, it's usually entomologists or whoever is collecting this data and looking at the data. Um, when we talk about farmers, it could be actual like farmers, it could be crop growers, it could be agricultural workers or farm techs, just anyone who's involved working on that farm. And then lastly, we're gonna be talking about extension agents and the um, government workers. And I already kind of explained that. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat, but should be good on that. Yeah. So when I, when I make these 
like personalized solutions. I try to use the least toxic things possible and I try to do organics. That way it's a lot cheaper and it almost works as a preventative. So I will say like, you know, you've had some aphids this, this week. So if you could spray this to prevent more aphids and then that helps them out because it's cheaper to do that instead of just wasting money on lots of toxic pesticides that they have to spray everywhere. And that can be a big problem. Um, right now in America and in the world too, we usually lose around 20 up to 80% of our crops to pests and cotton and wheat are some of the most important crops. And those are the ones that we lose. Like, I think it's 60% for wheat and 80% for cotton. So it's, it's really important to be able to see where the pests are and be able to prevent any outbreaks. But back to actually how I do this data collection. Um, what I do with the data right now is kind of stressful. It takes forever. And so I thought up some ways that would be really helpful, things that we would need. Um, we need an easy place to put data in and publish it somewhere. That way anyone can go from anywhere and look at it and they can see it in real time. So that way they don't have to wait for an email. They don't have to wait for a report from me. They don't have to interpret a spreadsheet on their own. They can just go log in and it'll be there. But we also need it to be able to be edited because everyone can mess up sometimes. And then lastly, we need it to be secure and anonymous. And that's really important because um, farmers and different crop growers, this is a very personal thing for them. Like this is their life. So if some other growers find out that this one farm has like a lot of thrips, for example, that could be really embarrassing for them. And it could influence how the other farms market their products. It could influence how they treat each other. It could influence a lot of different things. So it's really important to have that anonymity and security with the data. And then another, another point to bring up is cost. If this is really cheap, then that's great because a lot of the work that I do and people like me do is funded by the government. There's not a lot of money put into you know, agriculture. So if it's as cheap as possible, then it'll be able to be used more and by more people. Um, and then you're probably wondering like, what the heck, why hasn't anything been done about this if everyone just uses these Excel sheets and stuff. But there's, there, there are a lot of people in entomology who just are super comfortable just using what they're used to. There's not a lot of overlap between computer scientists and entomologists usually. I mean, they're both STEM fields, but they're pretty opposite in what we work with. Like, the only common thing is that we both have bugs. <laughs> so there's that, but I mean, it's just hard. It's hard to introduce new technologies and have everyone take them up and use them. So yeah, those are all of the problems that we have in my field. Um, and next Jacob can talk about some technical problems that we've had. Good thing that uh, for an industry with so many, you know, lack, that's an industry that's lacking technology that you're friends with, I think, three computer scientists that are on the call. So that's, that seems convenient. Yeah, it's been really awesome, actually. And so while we're looking at this from a technical standpoint, uh, the most obvious way to come about it is just like the old traditional sense of building a big server room and just kind of leaving it at that. And most people would say, yeah, that's a fine idea. But as we like look into it a little bit more, we can start to see like cracks that start to form. And we can see that these centralized solutions are going to leave a lot to be desired. For, for, the, for the first part, like server development and upkeep, as a lot of us know, can get very expensive very quick, especially when you're dealing with this amount of data and this large of a scope as we're looking at. And a lot of this has been mitigated somewhat by modern cloud solutions like uh, Amazon or like Google Cloud. But then you're sitting at the mercy of a bunch of cloud providers that just change their models whenever they feel like it's whenever they feel like. 
And after that, who's going to pay for all this upkeep? As Katie said, like a lot of these like agricultural specialists are willing and farmers are willing to spend a little bit more to have like a constant overview of their pests on their farms. But it's mostly universities that are going to be tending to collect all this data and analyze it. And any all these different uh, institutions have different standards for these reviewers and different extension agents. There's there's and that immediately shows us that there's going to be a trust and communication problem involved when you inter, uh, make it a centralized solution. And I mean, we can all sit here and act like that these academic institutions have excellent communication skills, that all these reviewers and researchers aren't going to have issues with one another day in and day out, and that they will all come to the same exact conclusion on how, how this should be handled and what kind of standards that they want to put out there for this trusted network. But we know that's not true. And even if it was true, which university is going to create this? Which department within that university is going to run and upkeep all these servers and make sure that this data is safe? Or do they even do it in-house? Do they hire an outside company? And how are all these farmers and agents going to know that this unknown entity to them is going to be running an essential part of their operation and make sure that this, this data is safe? How, the big question, how can they trust this entity? Even if they find like the best contractors with the best intentions, the over complexity can immediately lead to distrust, especially for the layman. Any solution that this that we come at this from needs to have needs to be made to last an extremely long time with minimal maintenance and have a relatively simple and trustworthy explanation so that we can explain to everyone in the supply chain at, the, at a way that they can understand. And we at the Public Pest Network have found a way to avoid all of these pitfalls by using a distributive ledger technology with the Jira Hashgraph. And to go on to go on in depth of why we chose this, I'll pass it off to Brian. Thank you, Jacob. Um, here we go. I think that since we are at a uh, DLT meetup right now, this seems a little bit obvious, right? I'm sure the red flags were all there of like a, oh, we have centralization issues, there are cost issues, there are complexity issues, there's a huge trust and accountability issue. It, it, it was, it's literally a textbook example of uh, distributed network solutions, right? Um, but I mean, it, it, for all of us here who are super into, you know, blockchain and DLTs, um, yeah, I, I recommend you take a step back and look at the, you know, the overarching complexity of the problem, because it's, it's not a small one, especially if you're not super familiar with DLTs or with blockchain or anything else like that. Um, I think uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, DLTs, uh, distributed ledger technology, um, is specifically designed to be decentralized. Uh, they normally help with a lot of these, you know, accountability and trust issues. Um, a lot of them tend to be a lot lower cost. Our one of our biggest things is right now all this data is stuck at Katie's level, and then uh, she abstracts a little bit and narrows it down and hands off to her manager, who then hands off to someone else, who then compiles it into a single report. It, it we lose a lot of the intricacies and the nuance that's really in the data that could be very very helpful, uh, not just for entomologists but uh, for anyone. So we uh, public access is a, is a huge huge deal for us. Um, uh, for those of you even more familiar with DLTs, you may notice that a lot of these problems have been solved already in the DLT community. So I think that uh, deciding to go with, you know, um, uh, public ledger DLT technology um, was really the way to go because it's at this point, we can we can kind of make it work for us. Uh, for a little bit there was really just deciding on um, which tech to go with. Uh, I, I think you, it's pretty obvious which one we went with considering who's YouTube channel on right now. Um, but Hadira really honestly did end up being the best option. Um, they had some really low complexity APIs. When we first started this whole project, um, I was able to, or we, we, we were able to whip out some really, really cool stuff within uh, 24 sleepless hours as we went through, it was super cool. Um, it's they still have plenty of customization for some of the stuff we're trying to work on now. Um, as we're trying to move into like a more advanced um, application. I think I even asked Cooper some questions as I was trying to see how far we could really push um, our, our message contents to see how much data we could really fit in there. Um, and they've been super awesome about all that. We've had some really cool options. Um, for anyone who's familiar with blockchain, but not super familiar, but kind of in the know, uh, the sort of like your semi-tech literates of the world, um, blockchain has become sort of a red flag anytime we talk about distributed technologies. It is, it's completely understandable. Um, but trying to go to a whole bunch of professors who have 
heard their colleagues complain about blockchain or complain about, you know, distributed technologies and all this kind of stuff. It's nice to be able to come back and say, hey, no, there are some some very important, you know, companies backing this. There's it's, it's really uh, has a really reliable foundations um, and we have a lot of faith in it. And that that then leads a lot of faith to them because it's important because if these guys, if these professors, if these farmers, if these people don't trust what's going on and just think we, you know, we pick just some random application or technology that's going to be gone in two years, I, they're not going to use it. So we, we really do need the most reliable one. Um, we, we have low cost transactions. Uh, I, I think that seems to be pretty easy. It wasn't necessarily the top of our list. Um, we, we care less about uh, the cost of the data and how long it takes to get there. We care more about, is it getting there? Um, we found that that, that's, that worked pretty well. Then there were some also, there were also some really unique features we didn't expect, uh, you know, uh, mirror nodes. And I think uh, tokenization is coming up the horizon, which is super exciting. We're looking for some stuff for that. Um, but mirror nodes themselves are super interesting for those of you who aren't familiar uh they they can manage your your topic groups on um, which basically are like group chats in a conversation so uh a huge issue with this whole project has been and the reason why it has been done before is maybe someone in, at university of michigan uh trust university of arkansas reviewers and maybe a select private group associated with them but then university of arkansas only trusts their own reviewers in their private group uh, and then maybe you know a michigan company uh only trusts their own reviewers so normally you'd have to make your own custom application for each one of these people and upkeep it and manage who's, you know, who has what whitelist of who. Um, this way with mirror nodes, we can literally just set one up for each individual uh, or group of individuals who, who care about such a thing. Um, and everyone has their own copy of their own data, which is a, a huge, huge deal, especially in this, in this sort of community. Um, to go a little bit more into the specifics of our architecture and technologies, I'm going to hand it back off to Jacob. So yeah, we're just going to give you a basic overview of the technologies that we've used, and we're going to start with the client side. So for, for our users and our entomologists, they're going to be interacting with a web app framework that we built in ExpressJS. Uh, we're, uh, we're hosting on AWS, and we're using a JavaScript controller to pass along data into both our, our MongoDB database and also transaction messages that get passed on to the Hedera API. And from here, the Hedera API will pass it on to different mirror nodes that we can that will record everything, and then we can use to display different different data. And to exactly what a user can do within our system, uh, our a user is going to be able to edit their profile through uh, the different locations that are associated with their profile and the insects lists that are linked in with those specific locations. They're going to be able to add a new record that gets published on the blockchain and also be able to edit the, edit different things, uh, edit different records using a uh, target ID. And we can take a look at what a normal message is going to look like on this as it's moving along the chain. And cons uh, as of right now, the technology that we're using is, are limiting the character, uh, character lengths that we have. And so we, we have we have set up a message to look like this, where we're going to have a 10 character uh, user ID code. Uh, we're going to use a four digit area code. And within the United States, uh, we decide to use a four digit area code instead of a five to make sure that these farmers can stay anonymous. And that if there's only like one farm in, in an area code, it doesn't get automatically pinned down to them. But also we're using this, we're also making sure that we're specific so we can decide what trends are happening in the data and like, pinpoint where they're happening. And after that, we have a we have about 110 characters left to just input raw data and all the bugs that you find it within a day. This is really interesting. I'd like to kind of maybe pause on that message schema that you guys have for the Hedera consensus service here. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, one of the things that Katie so, you know, eloquently put it is that like the Pest data for specific farms is very personal. It's something that they take pride and have, you know, a reputation against. But at the same time, you do need to be able to track bug flows to and from specific locations. You know, how important or how, how do you deal with that kind of sliding scale of, you know, we're retaining the location-based privacy, but we're also exposing enough of that location data that it's actually helpful information. You know, how did you come to this decision and how granular is the system right now? I don't know who, who that question's best targeted for. 
I, I think I think I'm going to take it. I think I know why Jacob's looking at me, which is uh, this seemed like a great idea at first when I realized like, oh, this is how uh, zip codes work, right? It's five digits. I found out that you can technically, it, they're grouped based on area and they are like sequential somewhat, which is super cool. So it's like, oh, we just dropped four characters. It'll, it'll abstract it, which uh, I think we tend to be looking at more of the county scale. It's not perfect because obviously if there's only one farm in a county or in one of these zip codes, um, you know whose farm has what going on, right? Uh, it doesn't, it's not perfect. So we tried to do the four digit area code as it, it seemed like a super genius idea at the time. As we found out more recently, I mean, obviously there's limits with just using a US based area code because it's in the US. So if we wanna to move to Canada or Mexico or you know expand this out of the United States, it's, it's already an issue. Uh, to furthermore, as I found out, uh, there's, they're not completely serialized. So uh, while there's no 405, while there is a 40502, there might not be a 40508. And so we have to sort of figure out and keep track of what area codes actually exist and what area codes don't actually exist, which then you can also assume that uh, there, there might only be one four, uh, five digit area code in a four digit area code sequence. So uh, all this is to say it was, a, it was a really good idea at the time. And that's sort of where we're, we're started and where we're, we're gonna stay for just right now, but it's still not a perfect solution. And I think we're still trying our best to find uh, a way to identify local areas sort of on this scale of more of the county, you know, you know, three digits, uh, three digit zip codes or three separate zip codes next to each other um, and still get that specific information and that precision of, of data. Um, but there's, it's still, still very much in, product, in progress. Yeah, that, that, that totally makes sense. I think um, it's almost like one of those things where you don't want to catch a farm uh, kind of like with their pants down, for the lack of a better term, where they do have bugs that aren't publicly disclosed. Uh, but at some point in the future, it could be an expectation that if you don't publish your data to a publicly verifiable network like this, that people will... Um, start to you know wonder what they're hiding and and so it's kind of like an opt-in model where it's like you know once once everyone can consolidate on this standard and it's understood that this is you know how the industry is going to help everyone move forward uh that privacy and anonymity becomes kind of less of an issue but more of a social contract which is is interesting to me no, for sure. And I think we actually even have some, you know, I, I think there are some farmers who are willing to opt in because obviously you get higher granularity of data, you get more information back. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, we have this going on for right now, but I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes, especially with some of that opt-in style stuff. One of the questions that we got in YouTube is actually, is this data encrypted at point, either like at rest or in transit? Um, I, I do think, you know, one of the main purposes of using the public DLT is that anyone who's interested in the data has access to it. Um, but just curious if, if you've thought about encryption schemes or, or what you're doing there. No, absolutely. I think that's an awesome question. Uh, we've been sort of uh, thinking about this a lot. Uh, we started... We, we started at the beginning of this project, and as we've mentioned with keeping the anonymity, uh, we, we've sort of tried to stay away from handling anyone's data that then would need to be encrypted. So uh, for instance, when, you, when we get over to the demo, you'll see you enter in, you can enter in a five-digit zip code. We don't even record the five-digit zip code. Um, it, we just don't want to handle it. We don't want to be. Uh, we don't want to be in charge of dealing with that. We don't want that liability. So uh, we are trying to move away as far as possible from handling any, you know, excessively secure data. Even you know people's locations. We are trying to shy away from, as you know, I, I think is evident. We don't have any encryption right now. Uh, what we are looking at, though, is as Katie's trying to enter in some of her some of her data, Katie does need to know even the specific farm names um, and what locations they're at. So for right now, we're already getting some of that data a little bit more so than we wanted to. And so we're starting to experiment right now with, I don't know about necessarily encryption, but what are some of the limits we can push with um, keeping people's privacy without losing their anonymity? Um, and hopefully encryption won't be a part of that anytime in the future, uh, but that might give you a better idea of where we're at with that uh, juxtaposition. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. You know, I, one of the things that's so fascinating to me is kind of like the permissionless nature of what you guys are building, which is like a public data set. So anyone in the world that's interested in the analytics or the real time flow of this pest data, whether it's a different university that's never contacted you or someone who's just, you know, trying to grow plants in their backyard or maybe capture specific bugs that they're interested in. Uh, would have the ability to have, you know, that raw data stream in real time 
and they wouldn't need an API key. They wouldn't need to sign up for a contract or, you know, be able to like, you know, reach out and talk to you ahead of time. Anyone who's interested in what's, you know, fundamentally a public good or, you know, a public data set uh, would be able to have access to it. So I think that this um, example of putting, you know, the time that it's received where it was and then like a string, a format of the actual pests found there and putting it onto something that's public and immutable and tamper resistant, like the Hedera consensus service, uh, really makes a lot of sense with my worldview and where I see public data sets moving. It seems that you need this kind of agnostic and kind of independent technical framework to facilitate that information sharing. Um, so that's you know one of the reasons why I'm so excited about you guys. But I think that's all the questions I had about your specific Hedera consensus service message schema at the moment. Maybe we can circle back to this, but I don't want to derail you getting uh, to your demo and stuff. All right, and so. After we send one of these messages along the chain, once it reaches Hedera, it's going to be passed along by a mirror node into our application, where we're able to going to be able to provide a display of a heat map of the different pests in one area. We're going to be able to provide pest prediction algorithms that based on our past and present data. And also we're going to provide alerts to different entomologists based on trends within our system. And to show you this all in action, I mean, Brian's, Brian is prepared to give you a live demo now. <laughs> Before the live demo, I think Megan asked, how can the public actually have access to this data? Um, maybe you just answered it with the, the mirror node, but if anyone wants to, uh, to tackle that question about how anyone could consume data from the public pest network. Yeah, uh, actually, so originally it was just supposed to be the mirror nodes. Um, and our whole idea was, you know, we'd offer the mirror nodes, we'd offer maybe our separate API where you could access some of this stuff. Um, as we got talking to more people, I think there was a little bit of misunderstanding as we were like, yeah, no, we'll set this up and then uh, we're just gonna make it that way and you can set it up for themselves. And then more people got talking about it and they're like, oh, can I just have that map? And we'd be like, well, no, you have to build the stuff to then build the map. And they'd be like, well, can I just have the map? Um, and so that sort of evolved into, originally it was just, uh, we'd set up uh, ways to handle our data and process it. And we'd, we'd give you some of the tools to get started. What we found out though, is a lot of people were just excited about just the raw data and just the visualizations. So uh, it's really evolved into now, pretty soon we'll have a public website up where you can check all of this out. You can be able to filter it by uh, what location you're at, what insects you care about. Um, that's all coming super soon. This is actually what we've all been working on for the last uh, couple of weeks as we're really trying to get this up and running in something really meaningful we can have out in your in your guys's hands but pretty soon i'll be on a website for you that makes a lot of sense so users or developers no matter where you are in the world can listen to the raw stream of data coming from the mirror nodes on hedera mm -hmm. read the data directly off ledger build their own web apps and services and front ends for it maybe feed it into a bigger kind of cloud warehouse like Elasticsearch or something that they can run easier queries against uh, but just for kind of the out of the box and basic use cases, it sounds like you're building some front end and data viz tools kind of around that as well, um, which is, is super interesting. Um, before the demo, another great question in the chat, distributed networks seem to create problems around data reliability. Is there a verification of data or a way to say a specific data from a specific user is more reliable? Uh, you know, thinking about things like reputation systems or verified entomologists inputting data. Uh, have you given that any thought? It's a great, it's a great challenge in the industry. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think actually this is our, this is our biggest uh, thing with the uh, public pest network. I think that that whole reason, and I think we're talking about right now, like in decentralized networks specifically, but this has been an issue for much larger than that, um, which is uh, how do we get everyone to trust each other? And the answer is pretty much you can't. Um, so the closest thing we can get is everyone gets to decide who they trust. So uh, if you're an institution, we will help you set it up so that way you decide who you trust and you'll have a whitelist of basically you only, only accept those users in your data sets. Um, the way that we've sort of been going uh, is we'd like uh, to widen it so that way almost anyone can enter their data, uh, even if it's uh, as, as hard as this, uh, I think that the, we'd probably move it more towards two separate data sets, which is everyone. So that way, you know, uh, a mom working on her garden can be like, oh, I just have these, uh, these beetles all over my yard. Um, I, I think that'd be super awesome to have on the, on the ledger. Unfortunately, 
as Katie has mentioned to me, humans aren't always, the, the, the untrained aren't always the best at identifying insects. They might mix them up. So I think the, the big two that we'd have most commonly would be just uh, actual entomologists and trusted users based on what we decide um, and based on what universities traditionally decide would be trusted reviewers. Um, then we'll have a public facing area where a, anyone can add data and that, that would be interesting. Um, and then if you wanna get more specific than that, you're welcome to you know, filter your own data and decide you know, what trusted reviewer is that way. What, one of our next big options is going to be, well, we have a list of current user IDs just in the, the traditional Hadira setup where it's I think like six or eight just digits on a screen, how do we associate that with a name and with qualifications? Because Katie has a degree in this. So how do you make sure that you get all the people with degrees and how do you attach the names to the icon IDs? So one of the next big things we're gonna be working on is a permission system to, while you can select between all of these, uh, actually share that like, yeah, no, uh, this, these reviewers all have degrees and are certified in this. And these reviewers all are currently active in this field and this reviewer, these reviewers are associated with this company. That totally makes sense. So, you know, just a, at a high level, like part of that message schema that we just talked about would potentially have like a user ID code or, you know, some type of saying, you know, this is who put it on the ledger. Uh, Katie, a consortium body, maybe an independent university could publish a list of user IDs from known reputable sources. And if you're picking up the data off the ledger directly, you could compare who's adding it to those known kind of uh, allow lists or approve lists or whatever you want to call it, those known sources. And then you could generalize it beyond there just to anyone who's adding data. Like, I don't know what bugs are in my plants. I would have no idea, but I would like to think that I could help out and contribute to the network in some way, you know, maybe to the best of my ability with like a, a ranking based on how accurate I've been in the past at identifying my own bugs. Um, but that's super interesting. That was a great question. Thank you, Jacob, uh, for asking that in the chat. Um, Something else that we've talked about adding in the future, kind of relating to that, is we want to add links on our uh, website to like University of Kentucky has a big page called Ent Facts. So if just your general gardener is on there and they have these insects and they don't know what it is, we would have the resources so they could go and find those resources, figure out what insect it is, and that way it would help them be more reliable and it would help their data be more accurate. So I think with the whitelisting that we'd be doing for um, the like approved data sets, and then that with the information that we'll have available, that will really help us have the most accurate data possible. That makes sense. I can even, you know, this is probably me being a blockchain enthusiast and engineer and over th thinking about engineering overkill this, but you could even come up with a way where like you send the image over Hedera's consensus service. So anyone has access to it. And then if you had enough people from those white lists confirm what type of species it is, uh, it could there be, you know, therefore become verified and you can kind of crowdsource uh, your bug verification. Um, that would be but, awesome. And there's yeah. a website called like Bug Guide where people do that. They post pictures and then people who know what the insects are, they say like, this is this. And so we could even have a link to that. That would be awesome to connect, maybe connect the two. It's like Stack Overflow, but for entomologists. I love it. Um, great questions. Please keep putting them in the chat, people, as we go. I think we have about 15 or 20 minutes left, so I'm going to let them get to their demo now. But thank you all for entertaining my, my questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we're gonna do a live demo now. So if we mess up, please, please forgive me. Uh, I'm gonna try my best here. Let's go. We, lo we love live demos on Hedera's virtual meetup series. You know, uh, <laughs> it really does give people the best insight into what's going on. And um, yeah, we're all along for the ride, Brian, don't worry. <laughs> Well, I'm quite gl quite glad to hear that. Um, this is the this is the the dev version of our of our website right now. Uh, we have a live version up. You guys don't have access to quite yet, uh, but this one's just the the most the most recent changes. I'm going to uh, actually here real quick. We'll go into this just for a second. Um, uh, here is just your account ID um, and private key. This is just the same account ID and private key to your Hadira wallet, just your login. Just log into the whole uh, Hadira network. Um, you can choose which network you're on. I don't think we're going to have this option when you're actually when we actually deploy. Uh, but this is uh, right now we're working on the test net, and very very soon we're going to be on the main net, which is super exciting. Um, I'm going to enter in my uh, 
credentials separate from i, I appreciate you taking them it. off the screen so no one takes your your private <laughs> keys here even though it's just the test network there's nothing they could yeah. really do with them but it's, it's a good security practice <laughs> thank you just making sure um, you have a couple couple uh, options here. Jacob mentioned previously, uh, we can add new data, we can uh, edit data on the ledger, um, or we can edit our user profile settings. So get, uh, let's just start by just adding some data. Um, so we'll just do the first zip code, um, and we'll select uh, a bug. We'll say I don't know white fly, and there's a hundred white fly, and we click submit, and that's all the public ledger. So that's that's pretty easy, right? Well. Let's say I, I meant to put 100 thrips, but I, I accidentally meant to put 101 thrips. Well, you might be saying, that's crazy. How would you do that? The, the, uh, the public ledger is immutable. Well, because of our UUIDs, you enter in the previous unique ID um, in here, add any changes, press submit, and then we'll process that downstream. So there's still the record. It's still a versioning history of who submitted what, when, um, but we don't, we don't lose any of that data. So let's go back here. And then we have our application specific settings. These are the stuff. I think I said this uh, the first time I saw your, your demo that you have more edit functionality in your blockchain application than Twitter has, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is great. That's, that's what we strive to have. Uh, here we can you know, select previous locations or add new ones. Uh, we're going to go to here and just add any old insect probably, you know, Mothra from uh, King Kong 4035. And here. And so this is basically Mothra. just mapping that Excel spreadsheet that Katie used to use into a web-based form that anyone could, you know, easily just access and write to. Um, 100%. But because you set up the message schema that, you know, anyone reading the raw data stream could, you know, interpret, they could add other bug types or other insect types or anything really to that schema, even if it's not supported on your form. Is that accurate? 100%. Um, and there are there are benefits and drawbacks to that. And, and we're trying to add some features to make it easier. Uh, typos, misspellings, um, you know, different capitalization issues are a thing. So we're trying to keep it uh, as localized as possible. So that way, if you, at least for the entomologists and reviewers who do this professionally, um, when you enter in a bug, it's coming from a database that we we know exists. And we know that this actually matches the spelling and everything. But that's that's pretty much it. It's, it's pretty simple. That makes a lot of sense. We're going to add 25 Mothra for the purpose of this demo. Um, and then, so that's that's more or less most of it for the public side. Um, the client side, I broke our live build. So we're going to use a private script, which will more or less do the same thing um, that our, our live build would do. So we're just going to enter in here. Um, no worries. Just, and this uh, could be an example of like a database admin or someone that's doing data analytics uh, could just run this themselves rather than going to your website, for instance. hundred. Yes, absolutely. This is going to be um, an alternative that we're doing for our website, which is sort of a demo of the things you can do with this data. Um, but hopefully, you know, and not hopefully, th this will be something that anyone can do hopefully better than I can, because uh, I think that there are some really smart data scientists, scientists out there. And I think it's going to be some really cool stuff coming out of here. Um, Right now, this is just our, our client, and this is going to be the equivalent of us just searching for an insect. Um, so we're going to do the white fly, which I think is Katie's favorite. Um, right now, we use Kabuto. Katie, for can all you confirm? Our... Is that your favorite? I can confirm. I do love white flies. They're very cute <laughs> and small. Um, they're a horrible pest, like terrible, but they're they're really cute. And I'm actually working on a white fly painting right now. <laughs> okay, that is good. Good to know. Thanks for confirming. Um, okay, so I see that you're retrieving uh, messages from Kabuto. Is that your, your mirror node of choice, Brian? Yeah, I think in the future we'd love to, you know, customize them and everything, but this just makes the most sense for what, what we're doing right now. That makes sense. Uh, we do have a, a question in the chat. Maybe we can talk about it while it's processing this data here, or maybe my timing will be bad. Um, someone's curious how edited messages are flagged, you know, how would someone know, um, you know, I would assume that you just take the last updated message ID for, for a specific entry, but curious if you've given that some thought. 
that's how we were thinking of doing it was we always we only ever like display the last edited um you know entry um however we'd love to have so that way if you could then you know search back through the through the ledger and just see if there's ever been any previous revisions of this and if so what were they totally makes sense i see it says we generated a heat map here i am intrigued yes we have so uh we we should have a heat map of white fly and uh, i'm going to drag this over And so based on our, our current data, here's the distribution of, of white flies in our, in our area. Um, this is not real. White flies might be everywhere. They might be nowhere, to be honest. I have no idea. Katie can answer that. Uh, but this is just at least using some of our, some of our prototyping data we did. Um, you can even see if we go back here. Um, currently, just the list of uh, all of our stuff from our demo topic ID, um, uh, all the insects that are in there currently. Um, if you look. Uh, here, 4035, there's our Mothra right there. So if we wanted to rerun this, uh, we're going to search for the, the message we just added, which I believe should only be located in 4035. Um, furthermore, this is uh, some of the examples of just the data we're trying to generate for people. Um, we want to make it easy so that way, even if you don't, if you have no idea how blockchain works, even if you've never heard of Fatira, you can still, you know, get your data. So we're going to have a couple of these as options to download, which are just um, a lot more, you know, high level overviews of based on locations, um, what what insects are in what areas. Uh, these are just some examples. Nice. But so if someone or a university didn't want to use the web based tools that you provide or doesn't have the resources, they're still getting their nicely properly formatted CSVs to, to look at. Absolutely. And nice. as we mentioned bef before with the zip code stuff, there's uh, even when we're going by zip code, we don't necessarily go off the entire zip code. Uh, we take just based off whatever Google Maps gives us from their geocoding API. Um, this is what we consider each one of these zip codes to be, which because Google Maps is Google Maps, it, it might be correct. It might be a little bit off, but you can you can double check that here to make sure the quality of our data. Um, and I believe this guy should be done. Hang on one second. I was in the I was opening it while it was running, and now it's angry at me. So we're gonna give it one second. But pretty much the only thing you should see, uh, the only thing different about this is gonna be there's one dot instead of a whole bunch. Also, as you can see, I have a I have another monitor behind this laptop. I normally work on the laptop or the monitor, so I thought it'd be a great idea to put two two screens, and then that's gotten a little bit more complicated, but. I've got a it's quick working. little bug joke to fill in the time if anyone wants to hear it. Um, what do you do with a sick wasp? You take it to the waspital. <laughs> that was amazing, Katie. Thank you, Katie. And perfectly timed, too. So now okay. if we go here, <laughs> one second. There we go. Those are zip codes that should have Mothra in them, which looks like we actually have two. So yeah. All right. I, I think that is the that's the end of our, our demo for right now. Uh, it, it should give you it's uh, it should give you a pretty good idea of what our stuff looks like right now while we're uh, in the middle of some big some big changes and updates. And uh, I to give you some really love it. I, I appreciate the live demo. Um, and hopefully there's no actual Mothra in anyone's uh, <laughs> areas. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, um, to give us well, thank you so much for the presentation and the live stream. I, I really uh, love what you're what you're doing. Um, if you had to look kind of more into the future, like what's next on your roadmap? What are some, some of the things that you're most looking forward to? Cooper, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think Lily could probably go into a little bit more information on that. Um, she, she's, she's set up for this, she's ready for this. Um, but we, we have a couple different things. Lily, could you, could you elaborate? Yeah, uh, Brian, do you wanna to move to that slide about some the things that we have coming up? Um, so, and well, and this is where we are currently. We have uh, the majority of the products project is in a prototyping phase. Um, our reviewer facing ends completely functioning. We're just kind of working on some improvements to make it a little bit better. Um, and our back ends completely functional. Um, but 
what we still need to be doing. Next one. Uh, we're on active development on our public facing and data visualization. Um, and we have a lot of proof of concepts with a lot of back end, but we're still in the process of setting up some useful ways to display that information, just like that cool heat map Brian was showing us in the demo uh, is one of the things we're working on. And we're also want to have several more prediction and data science tools. So ways that people could get on and see, oh, there's going to be a lot of thrips coming in in the next month. So I should probably get ready for that. Um, just to kind of help people. We also want the public to have access to all of those things and as well uh, have access to some raw organized data so people can use those. I think Brian mentioned that already um, with their own data science things or use those uh, in their research or their own projects. Uh, and we also want to add some infrastructure. I think you mentioned this as well for specific users, groups or permissions. Uh, that way data reviewers are restricted to what they can add or they can edit to kind of keep them accountable and then help also maintain the integrity of the data that we're collecting so people know what they're getting into and that they're getting accurate information. Uh, and then we do have a project timeline. Uh, so we're on the third point right now and we're still working on our public facing backend and all of those things that I was just mentioning. And so our next step is gonna be some cleanup and then Katie's gonna be presenting the project to her department so we can kind of see what they think and get some feedback. And then the next step after that, we want to add some reviewers and as well as like extension agents and farmers and um, entomologists like Katie uh, to start working to uh, use a beta version so that we can start working out any issues that we might be having or we can make adjustments based on their feedback. Um, at that stage, we'd also like to start presenting at like some conferences and kind of get our name out there and see if anyone's actually interested in using this, which I, I think people definitely are already. Uh, and at the last point on our timeline there, uh, we want to make this live and start setting up mirror nodes or topics for anybody that's interested in having one, uh, like universities or extension agents for specific counties, um, and we can meet people's individual needs on that. So that's kind of our, our general timeline for the next little bit. And then we have our fourth phase, for four phase plan here. Sorry, that's hard to say. Um, we're currently in the third phase on that. Um, we're just kind of adding features that we weren't able to add originally just because of time. Um, but now we're able to because we have everything functioning. So we're adding some more things. Um, and then our last stage is working on getting some more precise data outputs and some predictive data algorithms algorithms and uh, we must start ex expanding outside of Kentucky and you know across the United States and even further who knows <laughs> um, and that's kind of where we're at right now in terms of our future plans hopefully that kind of answers your question there definitely I, I love to to see this and as a uh college students and you know someone in a master's program it's very impressive i love your your methodical approach to uh bringing this to market and trying to scale it out and getting awareness it's it's very exciting uh to see so yeah i really appreciate that um and i assume this is where people can get in touch with you online if they want to learn more or uh poach you right out of college for for a job <laughs> Yeah, um, you can reach us all at any of these. Um, we do have like other emails and stuff, but mostly if you message us on Twitter, we'll respond. And then we do have a public pest network Twitter that all of us have access to. So if anyone has any questions or comments or just wants to follow us for updates, you can go ahead and follow our Twitter there. I think you can also send Katie pictures of bugs and she'll, she'll identify them for you. I will. That's a little perk. <laughs> <laughs> I actually use Katie for that a lot right now already. <laughs> well, that is great. Uh, thank you all so much for telling us what you're working on at the Public Pest Network, giving some insights into your team and how it's helping farmers, researchers, consumers, and moving what's a fundamentally analog system right now, or you know, just manually sharing Excel spreadsheets into something dynamic and real time with, you know, the ability to build reputation systems around it and, you know, plug and play to a modern technology environment. Um, so very exciting. Uh, I think we're going to hang out for about five, maybe 10 more minutes, depending on how many questions are in the YouTube chat. 
but while we have you here, is there anything else that you or your team would like to share with our viewers? I have more bug jokes if anyone <laughs> wants to hear them. We'll take one more bug joke before diving into the YouTube questions. All right, where do pets get their clothes? The thrift store. All right, all right. That might, might be one of my favorites from today. Thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll circle back to more bug jokes if it, people don't have enough questions in the YouTube chat. Um, Megan, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, Megan's curious, does the heat map compromise the anonymity by zip code or is it not that specific? Uh, since we're using the four-digit zip code, uh, we're basically right now just brute forcing our way through all of the zip codes that are listed under that afterwards, and just generating the uh, generating the points, uh, the geographic points afterwards. So it encompasses that entire range. So we're hoping that expanding outwards will include more farms and will keep the anonymity within within that. And so. This might be a question for Katie. Is that granular enough access or you know insight to know whether or not I should be concerned about bugs from neighboring farms or, or areas? Is that close yeah, so enough? Or bugs can fly and they can be transported on different things. I mean, I, I know that's kind of obvious, but bugs fly distances that you cannot imagine. Even the smallest insects will fly miles to get to, I don't know, someone else's corn. So even just knowing that there are bugs in your state is really important. Um, there is a gypsy moth initiative right now. I don't know how many people have heard about it, but there's an invasive pest called the gypsy moth that is in the northeastern part of America and is trying to come down. And so we have traps set all around Kentucky and we're trying our best to keep it out. But as soon as that moth hits Kentucky, the whole state needs to know because gypsy moths can eat like tons of plants. So yeah, it's, it's important to know just in the state in general. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, good, good things to know. Um, so I think we have another really good question here and you know, maybe they missed this part of the presentation and they can rewind once we post the link to YouTube. Um, but someone's wondering what value does Hedera and the Hedera consensus service give to this type of system compared to using a traditional centralized database or you know, API infrastructure. Uh, Brian, do you want to recap the, the DLT value add here? No, absolutely. I think this is a, this is a question we get a lot because it, it is a good question. I think there's a lot of times where there are problems where uh, you know uh, distributed solutions can be sort of shoehorned in where they're not necessarily applicable. Um, for this one, we have a we have a couple issues. So uh, the most important is that there's a trust problem between uh, multiple different universities and groups. We also want the data to be publicly accessible uh, for everyone within the chain, and we want complete accountability. Um, on top of that, we want just a really low maintenance solution. Um, oftentimes, if you're not in academia, you might not be familiar, but there's uh, you know there's there's these ancient servers that run in basements of different departments that have been running since 1990 that are running essential parts of the university that don't get updated properly and are really just you know kept alive as much as possible. And we really don't want this to be that kind of solution, especially if it if it hopefully does become extremely important and really does make a big difference. So um, something that's a little more dynamic that a lot of people can own um, and that it's specifically with Hadira, we can put a lot of trust into. Uh, there are some other distributed networks that are, that are good um, and, but they can be a little bit overly complex for what we're trying to do, uh, which complexity can you know, cause, especially when we're looking at some of the other blockchain issues, uh, like blockchain problems like uh, Ethereum, some of their tokenization stuff, it, it causes security issues. How are you going to explain that to a professor, all that kind of stuff when you know, Hedera, Hedera is working really well, has some, has some uh, low complexity solutions, allows to have a lot of customization, um, has that trusted council and has really low cost and reliable transactions. That makes a lot of sense, Brian. You know, I really think of you as kind of like a independent nonprofit or consortium that comes up with technology standards for all the universities or farmers or researchers or consumers or even like auditing boards or, you know, the FDA uh, out there where you have no skin in the game for these universities to lie about what data they're seeing. And, and you know, you're really just building a solution where they can communicate and 
if you know a university wants to stay in this world of using Excel spreadsheets and another one wants a modern Postgres elastic search, uh, really complicated architecture to do prediction algorithms in real time, uh, you're facilitating that exchange of information through an agnostic decentralized technology like Hedera, uh, where you know if it's centralized, one company has to run it, has to operate it, has to come up with those standards themselves. They're paying all the bills. You'd have to trust them not to nuke or modify the data. And you'd have to trust them to expose that data in a way where if someone does want to gain maybe a competitive advantage by running prediction algorithms on top of it, uh, that that's done in a fair way. So there's so many you know, unique challenges that I see from coming up with these kind of like independent ne public networks for public data uh, which is what I, I like so much about your, your solution. Um, the next question that we have in the YouTube chat is, I can see a lot of people wanting to see the data, but not many farmers wanting to add data. Uh, can you think of any ways to encourage farmers to, to post their data? Maybe Katie? Yeah, I can start answering this one. And if anyone else has any ideas, just feel free to hop in. But I think a big initiative for farmers to post their data is knowing that it will be helpful. So the way that I do things is when someone like when when the government pays us these grants to be able to go and do research, we go and we tell growers like this will be very helpful for you and it's free because I'm just going to do it and it will help you. And usually that's enough for them to say, all right, go ahead. So yeah, that's just knowing that it will be helpful for them is great. That will definitely be a big incentive and knowing, giving them that comfort, I guess, that it will be anonymous to some extent and that we're not going to be publishing their names and everything like that, that will be very important for them. That makes a lot of sense. Um, can anyone else here think of ways to incentivize people to share their data? Maybe you give them some cool prediction insights that you don't if you're not adding data. Or I, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. I think the main point of this project is to reduce the amount of pesticides that are used by a farmer. And if we can explain to these farmers that by posting all this data, we're going to be able to help you with being able to introduce different species that will be more cost effective than using all of these pesticides and also more healthy for everybody else then I think that will be able to help them get on board with it. Cool, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, thank you so much for joining our live stream, telling us about you, about the cool things that you're building. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to them, whether you're interested in contributing to the project, you want to consume the data, or if you want to just provide feedback or talk about bugs, uh, I highly recommend you reach out to the Public Pest Network uh, they are part of our Hedera Boost startup program, and so I'm sure you'll be seeing more and hearing more from them as they go throughout uh, their journey and getting into production and, and live deployments. Uh, but thank you all for joining the Hedera virtual meetup tonight, and I hope you have a good night, and we see you on the next one.